I've been coming here on this particular day for a number of years. I really don't know how many. And the title of the day is Christian Servants Day. I began preaching in 1965, and I've taught on the word doulos, or servant, many, many times, academically. But the word servant this year means a whole lot more to me than it ever did. And I'm beginning to understand that until you really serve, it just doesn't have the impact just hearing the term. Miss Dorothy had two major surgeries in January and five times a day because this wound has to heal from the inside out, I change that bandage, help her with whatever else she needs. If you're a nurse, I've gained great respect for you and for any caregiver, but that word servant, that's an interesting term. You can get frustrated you think it's never going to end, and all that kind of difficulty, which reaches way down in my subject today, my heart. But what I'm going to do is just expand what Glenn said, because we're going to talk about the heart in the way the Bible does in just a minute. Are you all confused about the way the world is now? You know, I'm beginning to think they should put our grocery stores on stilts. The prices are so high, the building might as well be too. Maybe they should put the gas station on stilts, too. What do you think? I mean, it's a crazy world, isn't it? COVID, war. I mean, I tell you, and I broke my glasses this week. These are my old ones. They don't have, these are the Robert Taylor glasses. Remember that picture? Well, they just don't. They work all right, but if I can't see what I'm doing, well, you'll know why. Strange. To, I heard about this engineer who had to cross the uh, river from his house on a ferry boat every day of his life. This particular morning, he was late. He grabbed his briefcase and spilled all the contents on the kitchen floor. They had to pick those up, put them back in the briefcase. He started running out the door, and his wife said, you forgot the briefcase. He had to run back in and get it. Came out the door and tripped and fell and spared the contents of the briefcase all over the sidewalk. And as he was picking it up, he noticed that ferry boat was very close to shore, and he thought, Oh, I better hurry. And so he ran down there and he thought, I can jump out and I can get to that ferry boat. And he jumped and he hit his shins on the end of that ferry boat. I mean, he scraped them, spilled the contents of the briefcase all over the place. But he was able to get his feet out of the way just as is the ferry boat was coming in to land. You ever had a day like that? Understanding our hearts, let's look at the definitions. The Hebrew word is lev, it's two letters, lamed base, there's an E in the middle in the English because that's what the Masoretic scribes told us how to, it was to pronounce. This word levav or vabel is the Hebrew word that you'll read sometimes comfort in the Old Testament. If you'll look at Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, speak comfortably to my people. The words translated comfort is L-E-B, love, or speak to my heart, speak to the heart of my people. But you'll recognize the Greek word in the New Testament. And when you, when you think about the New Testament word, always think figuratively. The New Testament word for heart is used figuratively, cardia. You've heard of a cardiac arrest. Well, we just transliterate it into English, the Greek word cardia, and we have our English word cardiac. So you have the two words now. But these words mean something different when it comes to either the physical meaning, Old Testament, never in the New Testament, or the figurative meaning. And when you think about the figurative meaning, you have to think about your emotional, intellectual, and moral center. Your intellectual, moral, and uh, emotional center. Sometimes in the Old Testament, this word is used for something that's inaccessible. I want you to think about that when we take a look at a passage in the New Testament that's often used as two steps in the plan of salvation, but it goes far deeper than that in the original language. It's sometimes used for things that are inaccessible. 
Jonah talked about the heart of the sea, which was inaccessible to him, Jonah 2, 3. All modern people and all ancient people understood that our physical heart was behind our rib cage. However, the ancients thought about that differently from the way we, that we do. They thought that the heart moved the rest of your body, that all the parts of your body were moved by the heart. Look at Genesis 18.5, where Abraham told the people there to eat and so they could uh, pass on their way uh, as, uh, by blessing their hearts. He thought if they had a full stomach, it would bless the heart, which would move the body. Genesis 18.5. However, the heart figuratively is so hidden to us there's only one who can judge it. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Godhead is the judge of the heart. In fact, the Proverbs writer and Paul both talk about the inaccessible hidden counsels of the heart that are open, only open by the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Look at Matthew 12 now, 23, 33 and 34 with me. When you think about the Bible heart, you have to connect it to this thing right here, your mouth. Connect the two now. Your mind, your intellect, your moral activities with your mouth. Because the mouth betrays the heart of man. A wise man's heart guides his mouth. Proverbs 16, 23. Now, look at Romans 10, 9 and 10 with me. Here's where I want to connect something for us that's usually not connected. We talk about these as two, two steps in the plan of salvation, but something more was really being said here by Paul. Because the ancients joined the heart and the mouth, thinking that the center of our intellect, moral and intellectual, uh, uh, rational activities, emotional activities are all centered there. So when you put the mouth into action, you're putting yourself into action. And so what Paul was actually saying is, salvation comes from the heart expressed. That is, I have put my heart, and I'm going to find out what that is in just a minute, into action. And so he's actually telling you the whole of it. When the mouth does what the heart is thinking, it is expressing the desire of the heart. It's putting the heart into action. All of the ancients in all of their writings, Old Testament, New Testament, all of them join the rational and the irrational parts of man. Look at uh, Psalm 20, verse 4 with me. Here that God has asked this, grant them according to their own heart and fulfill all their counsel. God, if they're thinking it, you just go ahead and grant it to them. It's interesting that sometimes God just gives us enough rope until we hang ourselves. He allows us to go on in our thought processes. And in fact, Jesus said it this way, from within a man's heart come the evil thoughts, Mark 7, 21. So when I introduce this subject to you, I'm talking about a figurative use of these words for our purposes today that have to do with our emotional, intellectual and moral activities. That's why the Proverbs writer said, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Let's put together two verses of scripture here, and maybe we can help ourselves understand something. Paul wrote to the Christians of his day, something that's applicable to us in, in a wonderful way. He said, there's a peace of God that comes to us that passes understanding. And that peace is not a worldly peace. That's why I put John 14, 27 up there. Jesus said, my peace I leave you, leave you not as the world leaveth you, I give you. He had a different kind of peace for us. In the uh, Bible, this word heart is used somewhere around a thousand times, and half of them are in the prophets and the wisdom literature. 
But I want you to think about that a minute. The peace of God that passes all understanding is mine if I do something. That's why the Proverbs writer said, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. He didn't say to do anything but keep it. It's already made by God to do that. So keep it that way. How do I do that? Why, am I, why is he telling me to keep my heart? That means above everything else, according to the Hebrew word, above my family, above my job, above my bank account, above anything, I keep my heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Jesus said it this way, where your heart is, your treasure will be. Matthew 6, 21. And then the psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Parallelism. Try me and know my heart up here. And, try, and so he'll know their thoughts. Now, Glenn said, we are our minds. Therefore, we are our hearts. So if I have a figurative use of the word heart, I ought to be able to put my name in it every time. Because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about me. In the Bible, we have an idea here that we need to understand that has to do with our control center. In the Bible, the heart is a control center. Every decision is made from it. It's the place where I have my in place now, where I have my will. It's located there. It's the place where I have my attitude. They're located there. It's the place where I have my intentions. They're located there, but it's also the source of my thoughts, the source of my actions, the source of my words. In other words, it's I. And I said it that way for benefit of the medical school preaching students who are studying English. I didn't say it's me, did I? Wouldn't be right. It is I. I'm talking about Keith when I talk about my heart. That's who I am. And that tells me something. When Keith chooses to do evil, it's his heart doing it. It's not something that was caused by an outside source. The devil never made me do it. I thought it, and I did it. And so I choose all of my actions. Now, if I will connect my heart, that's Keith, to God then the choices I make will unlike, likely not be evil ones. Look at Psalm 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his heart? How do you do that? Or his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Well, now, if I will put into the heart all of this message, the choices I make will be connected to God. Let's go and listen to Moses preach this morning. Moses, whom are you talking? I'm talking to all my Jewish brothers and sisters. And I, I'm having to leave them, but I'm telling them what they need to know so they can prosper in the land. But I'm also going to warn them that if they don't do it right, God will put them into captivity. And so he's standing there talking to this huge crowd, Moses says. Why? What's he doing? He's telling them to connect themselves to God. Moses why would you preach that kind of a message to people? Because it's their choice, the choices that are going to cause the problems. Look with me at Matthew 19, 14. I don't know if you've thought about this verse in connection with the fact of how we are when we're born, but Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Just allow those little ones to come up here. They are pure. Well, what happened along the way? The devil didn't make me do it. 
I know God didn't make me do it. Let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with neither, neither he tempted any man with evil. James 1, 13 through 15. God doesn't do that to us. God didn't make me do it. The devil didn't make me do it. Well, what happened? I was born pure. And then I did some things called sin. What happened? Because I wanted to do it. I did it. I chose to do evil. And the hard part is stopping it. That's the hard part. Because it's my choice. David said it this way. As he thought about that terrible sin with Uriah and Bathsheba, he said, God created me a clean heart. And renew in me a right spirit. Make me better, Lord. Now, I said we need to connect to God. And since I'm my heart, and I need to keep it with all diligence, I need to do the utmost to keep it pure. So what I read, watch, think, is all connected to my attitude, my intellect, my moral activity. And that's why Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing, Watch him now, listen, the words that I speak unto you, listen to him, they are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. When I think about all of those verses that they caused me, asked me to memorize at Memphis, I'm grateful because they're all in there. And, and maybe I'll make a, have to make a choice about something and I think, well, what would the Lord say? Let's go back to Moses now. He's standing there talking to this loud group of people. So what they did when they, he got through with his speech is they ran home and checked their Bible to see if he told the truth. I just lied. He didn't have any Bibles. How were they supposed to teach their children what he taught them? They don't have a Bible. There weren't any scrolls around. How are you going to do that, Joe? They're going to have to memorize what he told them. They're going to put that, have to put that thing up in here. You know what our students tell us, Jameson? They, all tell, they complain about all the memory work, don't they? Complain about it all the time. But that's the best thing. But I tell you what, Caleb, the best way to kill a church is ask the adults to memorize the Bible. Oh, I didn't mean to be so sarcastic. Well, Caleb, you weren't even listening. That one was for your benefit. Wasn't it? How many of you like to take tests in Sunday school? That'll kill, a, that'll kill an adult class, won't it? What happened there? Listen, the best thing you can do is memorize the Bible, or at least some verses that will help you. Look at Romans 8, 16. How are you going to benefit from this statement unless you know what the text says? He said, the spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm the child of God. How am I going to know whether I'm really a child of God unless I can know what I am, what my heart is, and what the scripture says, and then match it? The spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm the child of God. If I'm doing what the book says, if it matches, then I'm God's child. It's that simple. All I need to do is start putting it all together. But maybe Jeremiah had it, right? Maybe Jeremiah had his finger on the problem with our hearts. Since I'm my heart and my intent is to keep it pure, I have to remember what Jeremiah said. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Well, that was our question today, understanding my heart. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Again, they connected the heart with their actions. God said to Jeremiah, you'll find me, Jeremiah, when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. Look at Matthew 5 with me for a minute. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain apart. And when he was set, 
Well, you suppose the Holy Spirit told us he sat down. Is that important? It is from what, the way the speech ends. He taught as one having authority. He's teaching as a rabbi would from authority when he sits down. The Catholics call that ex cathedra from the seat. You have a building that's called a cathedral. You have a bishop in, or an archbishop in the seat of authority there in that building. He's teaching us with authority. He opened his mouth. I wonder why the Holy Spirit told us that. Well, that's the way of saying to a Hebrew, prophet's about to speak. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 11, the way prophets did it. That's what he's about to do. And here are his disciples sitting at the very feet of the second person of the Godhead. Let's go sit with them for a minute. Now, if we have, and we are now having a chance to sit at the very feet of God, brothers and sisters, what's the most important thing on his mind? What's he want to tell us? What do you expect to hear sitting at the feet of God for the very first time? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's number one. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When I got too much Keith, I can't have any Jesus. When I got too much world, there's no room for him. I need to understand that I have to empty Keith from all of that old stuff he was and create in me a clean heart. That's why he told us, Matthew 15, 9, out of the heart come all these problems. Since I said earlier, and I want to comment on it now, that this word cardia in the New Testament is used figuratively. I want to draw your attention, that should be Romans 16, 18, if you'll change that in your notes, to these words in the New Testament that are used with different prepositions. And they mean something different when they put the preposition on the front of cardia. And the first thing I want you to notice is that in the New Testament, sometimes this is the seat of our impulses the seat of our impulses. Here, he talks about those false teachers who with fair words and speeches can deceive the heart of the simple. Underline the word simple. It means single-minded. Now think about that with me. Paul was so concerned about these brethren who, sing, who were single-minded in their devotion to Christ, yet he knew he knew that they could be deceived by words of human teachers. Why? Because the heart can act impulsively. There was a preacher back in the 1800s named Theophilus Brown Larimore. Great, great preacher T.B. Larimore was. One of the finest Old Testament expositors I've ever read in terms of that period and the way he preached it. But Brother Larimore understood impulse. And he was the kind of preacher that could move an audience to tears, but he saw that when they were moved to tears, he would never offer the invitation. When he was asked why he practiced that, he said, because I don't want them responding just out of emotion. I want them to know what they're doing not just impulsively acting on it. It's possible, brothers and sisters, for us to listen to a powerful preacher and by impulse get carried away with what he's saying. That's what happens when some of our brethren listen to some of these denominational preachers. They're dynamic, they're powerful, and the impulse of the heart is, well, that sounds really good. Until I start, start taking a look at the word of God that should have been hidden in my heart so I didn't sin against God. And so the word can mean impulse, impulsiveness. Look at Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. 
Here the word cardia is used with the Greek word ales, which means holes, excuse me, which means the whole of it. So if it's in my relationship to God, I, my heart, my heart, have to be intellectually, morally, and emotionally involved with God. He stood on the shore cooking a meal for them. They were out fishing. They'd gotten discouraged after his crucifixion. They said, I go fishing. Peter recognized who it was. And when they got through with that meal, the Lord said to Peter, Lovest thou more than these things? I used to think he meant these other disciples, but he, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't try to split the disciples. He was talking about the things he just gave Peter, worldly things. He said, agape me, Peter. Peter, would you serve me out of loyalty? Peter used a word that had to do with his whole emotion, his whole intellect, his whole moral. He said, I phileo you. Lord asked him again, agape me. He said, I phileo you. Third time the Lord said, well, if you phileo me, Peter, act on it. Feed my sheep. When I have loved God with my whole heart, I act on it. Look now at Mark or Matthew 9, 4. Matthew 9, 4. Sometimes our hearts just have to think about it. In fact, Jesus was talking to some Pharisees, and he said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? They were pondering. They were deliberating on it. The word there means to deliberate in their hearts. But I love the one in Philippians 1, 7, and I'll skip down to it. When the Bible talks about someone saying, I have you in my heart, it means exactly the way we use it, I love you. I, my heart, love you. I'm intellectually involved with you, emotionally involved with you, morally involved with you. So it's used of the person himself and his values. But it also is used this way. When you think about the Bible heart, think about what things you understand. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. When my heart, when I am wrapped up in God and his word, I don't have to be persuaded to come to Sunday school. I don't have to be persuaded to come to worship. I don't have to be persuaded to pray or study. Because my eyes are open, my ears are open, my understanding is open to what he's saying. Jesus knew something about us. He knew that the minute we heard new information, it started bouncing off of everything else in our hearts, in our minds, in our thought processes. Everything we ever learned or knew is the minute we got new information, it starts bouncing off everything else in there. That's called cognitive dissonance. There's a chaotic situation in our minds. So what we do is we expose that new, heart, that new thought selectively. But the only way we can perceive what we just learned is based on what we already know, so we deal in selective perception. And so he says their heart was hardened. When they got that information, it bounced so much around in their evil thoughts, they couldn't deal with it, so they just kicked it out. And so the... Roman, the Paul wrote to the Romans about the ancient patriarchs. He said it this way, because that when they glorified him as, a, as God, because when they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations. Watch this. And their foolish heart was darkened. Hmm. God wants us to understand. That's his desire. Look at Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding be open. What should I know? That we are the riches of his inheritance. The word inheritance means trophies. God won us in the battle with sin. We're his trophies. We are standing on his trophy shelf. And we now can shine in the face of Christ because of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God wants me to understand. That's why he gave me the book. And when I read it, I can understand it. Ephesians 3, 4. And I can be a shining example in the face of Christ. And Next to last this morning. Our heart is the sphere of our influence. This is where faith works. It's where faith works. That's the place of it. Purifying their hearts by faith, Acts 15, 9. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. It's the center where faith works. And so what it means when you say someone has no faith it means he doesn't understand. He hasn't been involved intellectually. He hasn't been involved morally. He will not bring himself to the point of understanding. It's not that he has no belief in something out there. It's that his faith has no place to work. He won't let it. My heart, what I am, is the place where faith works. So if I have no faith, I might as well have left God. That's why the Hebrews writer said, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 5. I've talked a lot about the heart this morning, but it's still a place that's hidden And the only one who really knows it and can judge it is God, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. And that heart is clearly open to him. He knows me better than I know me. And he certainly knows me better than any other human being knows me. That's why it's very, very wrong for us to judge a person's heart. We can't see it. We can't know what he's going through, not really. We might be upset with what he does, but judging his heart is something that's left to God. And so we close with Luke 21, 34. The New Testament heart is the center of my psychic and spiritual life. Brother Glenn's already talked about that. My physical vitality is connected to my heart, Luke 21, 34. In fact, Luke wrote that he filled our hearts with food and gladness. Well, you don't put food into your physical heart, do you? It's the center of my will. As he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Barnabas preached to the church that they with, with purpose of heart cleave to God. And so the supreme center of what I am is called in the Bible, heart, soul. And Jesus looked at a group of people one day and said, ye are they which justify themselves, but God knows your hearts. Luke 16, 15. There are 28 verses in the New Testament with that very idea in it. God knows your hearts. In fact, Jesus told the church in Asia Minor, I am he that searcheth the reins and the hearts. There's an interesting word connected to the word cardia in the New Testament that has to do with having a callous. And so when you read about a hard heart, it's calloused. What happened? Because first the thought, then the conduct. 
those who counsel drug addicts, alcoholics, know that it's that first thought that's the dangerous part. And brothers and sisters, keep your hearts <laughs> with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I am my heart. That's, that's that eternal part of me. That's the eternal me that God's going to judge. That eternal soul, my psychic makeup, is what God is looking at. And the problem is, it's connected to my body. I am. And so what I do with my body affects my self. It affects my heart. And that's why the ancients connected the heart and the mouth, the heart and the expression, the heart and the action of every moral activity, of every intellectual activity, of every emotional activity. And so if you say to God, I love you with all my heart, what you're really saying is, God, everything I am belongs to thee.